it is Wednesday afternoon, October 19th, and we will be picking up in, I almost said Revelation, Genesis, Bereshit, Sheep, chapter 12, and we'll look verse 7 on verse by, um, word by word, but just as a very quick review, we know that Avram has started out, he's crossed over, that made him a Hebrew, crossed over to Euphrates literally, but also crossed over from idolatry into worshiping and following the one true and living God who said, go. And he didn't say, go where? <laughs> he went. He started out well. He didn't start out completely obedient because he brought family with him. He was to go out alone. He makes a, a pit stop in Haran. We have no idea how long that lasted, but long enough that he settled there and he picks up baggage to bring along with him. As he comes on down into the land where we have him, where we're picking up today, he still has his nephew Lot with him. He took Lot against God's instructions. God still allowed the partial obedience. He didn't say, you're out, it's over, I will have nothing to do with you. But Avram's going to pay the consequences. It's going to spell trouble later. So if you want to partially obey the Lord, have at it. Just realize there will be a consequence to pay. That partial obedience doesn't cut it. Um, we don't know if Lot was married at that time. We doubt it because of the way people were named and there's no name there for Mrs. Lot. So he probably picked her up from those who were in idolatry. And it makes sense when we see what she does in chapter 19 and the way that their daughters act following also. But I think both are in chapter 19. But that's for another Wednesday. A little down the line. Anyway. As he went forth, verse 6, um, he, went to, he was going to the land that God would show him. God did not promise Avram this land. Now, I have to because it gets out of context. I have to put that, the brakes in there and say he does promise him this land in chapter 13. But in chapter 12 where we're at when he told him to go, he just told him, I'll show you a land. But it, uh, and he promises it to his seed to those who would come after him. Uh, but he does promise it to Avram also when we get to chapter 13. So Avram is passing through. It wasn't intended for him to come in and hit just right across the border and plop and stay right there. No, God wants to show him the land. So he's traveling. He's uh, moving through Canaan, the name of the area. He didn't get an occupation that would keep him in one place. Um, God didn't tell him to do that either. He comes to the area of Shechem. We saw that last week, that it means shoulder or place of strength. We saw a lot of things that happen in that area um, all the way through into our Brech Adashah, our New Covenant. Also, when Yeshua talked to the woman at the well, that this is that Samaria area, and that well is a well called Yaakov's well, Jacob's well, who happens to be the grandson of Abraham. So you're going to see he does have seed, and he does his seed settles in this land, in this area that God said he would give to his seed. But we didn't get that far. We looked at the fact, and where I think we really kind of cut off was the Oak of Mamre. So if we look in verse 6, we have the Avram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem. Now Shechem's still up north. We're, not, we're still above Jerusalem. But everybody, I think, knows where Jerusalem is on the map of Israel. Shechem is, is north of that. And you know how much of Israel is down below Jerusalem, so it's not like he's gone through the whole land. He's coming down from the north, traveling south. Mm -hmm. And he's come as far as Shechem, and he's come to the Oak of Moray. Now, Moray was the name of, um, if this was a, a grove, by the way, the, the oak doesn't mean just one singular tree. It means a grove of oak trees that belonged to a Canaanite by the name of Moray. This was a person. Uh, oak groves, we see in scripture, were often a place of religious concourse. Altars would be set up in them. Let me prove my points, but to make you understand, and I don't want to go to the negative, but it's the only thing that I know firsthand to tell you. For those of you who grew up in the San Bernardino Redlands area, you know that the Redlands area had more than it does now, but many, many orange groves. And if you knew, if you were in the know of what you shouldn't be in the know of, there was idolatry in those orange groves. There was wickedness that would take place and probably still does in some of what's left. I can't say because my ears are to the ground for that. I want no part of it. But my point being is what we're going to see that they did back in Bible times, 
like Shlomo Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. They were doing it in our orange groves here in our area so we can relate and understand. Let me show you, go with me. Uh, I'm going to work backwards because the way my tablet's set up. They set up altars in this area. Altars are places to worship. It doesn't mean that they're worshiping the one true and living God. That altar is to whoever they set it up to. Go with me to Yahshua, to Joshua, chapter 24, and 20, verse 26, and we'll see one of those altars mentioned. 24, what? 24, 26. This is when Joshua's come into the land. This is much later. This is over 400 years later because we've got um, the children of Israel as slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And we've got to get them down to Egypt. We've got to have them in the land first. So we're probably at least 500 years out. But it, it shows you it was still being done. Um, in verse 26, it says, jo Okay, okay, sorry, I do have the right verse. And Yahshua, Joshua, wrote these words in the book of the law of God. He took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So in that oak grove, he had made a sanctuary. He had made an altar. He had made a place to worship the one true and living God. I'm telling you there are altars that were evil, not to the one true and living God. Here's one that was to the one true and living God. It was something that, that just was done in the culture of the day. Like today we have many churches. They're not all to the one true and living God, but that's a common thing for a group that's religious to have a place, whether they call it a church, sanctuary, whatever they're calling it. So just giving you the idea of what it was like. But to see a little more, let's go backward toward Genesis. Again, we're going to stop in Deuteronomy. Uh, Davarim, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 21. Deuteron Deuteronomy 16 and verse 21. Davarim in Hebrew, if that's what tripped you up. 26, right? Deuteronomy. It for Joshua, yes. And now yeah, we're uh, Deuteronomy 16, 21. You shall not plant for yourself an Asherah or Ashereth of any kind of tree beside the altar of the Lord your God which you shall make for yourself. What God's giving them is command. When you set up an altar by the oak trees when, or um, whatever tree it was named here, if it named it, he's telling them you don't make it to Ashtaroth or Asherah. That was the name of a false god very well known in that time. That kind of, the worship to Ashtaroth was prevalent. If I took you to Judges chapter 3 and verse 7, if they're called idols there. If you have the old King James, it's called groves. These idols, the King James said, they were made to Asherah. Asherah is a Hebrew word for idolatrous groves, idolatry, this sort of thing. So very, very clearly, idolatry... What's the name of a tree? Uh, it was the name, of, the, the name of the one they were worshiping. When they'd make an altar under the tree, don't make it to Asherah. Because Ashtaroth stood for idols, stood for false worship, that sort of thing, from the Hebrew. Um, and let me show you idolatry practiced, okay? Go to Isaiah this time. Go all the way to Yeshia, Isaiah, because unfortunately, it, our people were warned and told not to, but repeatedly they uh, go into idolatry. We see it through the ages. We see it all the way down to today, really. There's a lot of false worship around. Um, that's why scripture will even tell you test the spirits to see if they're true. Don't just think because it sounds good. It is good uh, Isaiah Yeshia chapter 57 verse 4 57 verse 4 and 5 I'm going to read against whom do you jest against whom do you open your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion offspring of deceit who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree, who slaughter the children in the ravines under the clefts of the crags. What that's telling you is these children that were rebellious against the Lord that he's calling out, he's saying that, that you know, you're sticking your tongue out at me, you're, you're, you're flaunting yourself in my face, and then what are you going and doing? You're, you're inflaming yourself, you're bringing fiery judgment on yourself because you are among the oak trees among these, these luxuriant areas, giving your children a sacrifice, killing the children in the rivers that are sacrificing them under those trees to these false gods. 
It's no wonder God was, had fiery indignation at them. That if they were deserving of it. He never tells them to do human sacrifice. Never. On the contrary, he's the one who gave his life for, for uh, us, not asking us to give our life in sacrifice for him. Uh, yes, figuratively, but not physically. In Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse 13, he says, Then you will know I am the Lord, <coughs> then you will know that I am the Lord. When their slain are among the idols around their altars on every high hill, on the tops of mountains, under every green tree, and under every leafy oak, the places where they offered soothing aroma to all their idols. So see, continually, they're giving worship to idols. They're, when they're burning incense, that's what was to be done in the Holy of Holies, or the holy place, leading into the Holy of Holies. That was not to be done to false gods under the oaks, you know, where they were out there practicing. So it was a common practice is what I'm trying to bring out to you. And uh, this grove that, that um, Avram has come to belonged to Moray. He was a Canaanite. We know that God said, they're so evil, I'm going to thrust them out of this land and give it to you or at this time to your offspring. So really, probably the, this oak that the area came to was probably a well established sanctuary with an altar to worship false gods and Abram's being warned not to be a partaker of that um, remember he lived in a land of idolatry he was brought out from that he left behind idolatry but God's warning him don't go back don't don't go don't turn in that direction so he um, it, it, when we go back to Genesis we do see, you know, that, that God's going to make him a, a promise. I've got to finish verse 6, so I just realized I didn't do the last phrase. I told you that Moray was a, a Canaanite, near English, Canaanite, Canaanite in Hebrew. Uh, it says, now the Canaanite was then in the land. That's that cursed line. That's Ham's line, Ham. And again, that spells trouble. They're going to contest Avram occupying the land that God said is his. We're going to see that Satan's forces wrestle with the believers all the way down through time in this area. But God's will is what will be sustained. And when he comes, he will cling the land of all the false idolatry. But that doesn't mean we wait for that. We're told to occupy till he comes. Let me show you what I mean by that. Run real quick to Luke in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant. Go to Luke um, chapter 19. Luke 19. And in Luke 19 and verse 13, we read there, And he called ten of his slaves. He gave them ten minas, that's a form of money, and said to them, do business with this until I come back. This is a master that gave something to his servants and told them, go do business with it. If you follow the story, you know some bring, bring back much with their money, some a little, and some did nothing, even buried it in the, in the ground, and um, they're taken to task. Because the thought and idea behind it is be active for your master. We are to be active for the Lord. We don't just wait for him to come clean it out. We do what we can to clean out idolatry in our own personal lives and around us. That was Luke what? That was Luke 1913. 19, yes. And if you don't have those pages of cross references, tell me what pages you're missing and I'll get them for you because uh, it was there, but no oh, worries. Okay. You may just not have it right in front of you, so, which is fine. And Zoomer may need it repeated, so no worries. <laughs> okay, so the Canaanite is not a good line. They are there in the land. God showed them, God showed Avram they are there, but they'll be the ones cast out. Um, he shows Avram that the land belongs to others. He cannot possess it until God says so. And God didn't tell him yet, remember? God just told him to go, and I'll show you. So it's go and show. So he couldn't come into that land, look at the king, and I'd say, out in the name of God, because this is to be my land. He hasn't been told that yet. Um, and the Canaanites had no intention of giving up their land to Avram, and they won't give it up for at least 400 years more when Yahshua, Joshua, 
leads the children of Israel into the promised land in victory when they're right with the Lord. So we've got Moshe in this area. He is in the land that is promised to his seed in, in time to him. But verse 7 has something very interesting happen. I left you on this to think it through last week when we were together. We're reading, the Lord appeared to Avram and said, I'm going to stop us right there and make us stop and think. Like I say, this isn't just a story to just read. This is something that's pertinent to our lives today. This is the living word of God. We want to understand it and we want to learn what we can in relation to it. So when we're at this point in time, we've got to take ourselves back to Avram. Okay, this is before Moshe. We don't have a Moses yet. We don't have Paul and Peter and James. We're going way back in time. This is early on. This is the early patriarchs. And the Lord appeared. How did the Lord appear? Because with Josh, we're still going and wandering, right? They, we haven't even hit the time of the children of Israel wandering yet. We're not even to that point yet. We don't have the children of Israel yet. Oh, wow. We've just got Avram, and he's crossed over from idolatry, <clears throat> and we're told the Lord appeared to him. Okay. Now, notice also, there is no record of Avram getting any further revelation from God since he left Ur the Chaldees. When he stopped in Haran in partial obedience, we don't read that the Lord appeared to him there and talked to him there and gave him more knowledge there. But now that he's coming in, into where he's supposed to be now God's beginning to reveal more to him but we've still got a little problem we're going to see something about that appearing but my point being God's never going to drag you to where you're supposed to be he is going to encourage you he's going to draw you he's going to in the right way entice you to come to where he wants you to be so he didn't let Avram get so comfortable he stays in Haran remember his father died in Haran it took that death to cut the ties to get Avram to move forward in obedience. Now that he's moved forward, now that he's come to the land God told him to go to, now the Lord appears to him. But how did he appear to him? Our knowledge of the Lord in human form is not for, oh my goodness, how many thousands of years? We're <laughs> well over 2,000 years. I'll just put it that way to be safe. Okay, so what does it mean when the Lord appeared to him? If you went looking or if you have studied, maybe you begin to know. There's a word called theophany. Theo is, means God. Theophany is an appearance of God. And it's him taking on either a human form or an angelic form. There are times when we read in scripture the angel of the Lord, and from the context it's very clear the angel of the Lord is the Lord. It is Jehovah. It, it is um, God in that appearance. But this is the first time that we're reading it this way, that the, the, that, uh, the Lord appeared. Okay, and that's why I want it to stand out at us. We know that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He walked with them in the cool of the evening. If you remember back then, we talked about that. We don't know what form he took of them, how they knew. They heard footsteps because when they ran to hide, they hid because they heard God. They heard his voice. They heard his footsteps. <laughs> they did not hear his cell phone. God has no cell phone. He, he's got a direct line. <laughs> he needs no intermediary. We're trying to get it off. Okay, there we go. All right, so God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. We know that he spoke with Enoch. Enoch is the one that didn't see death. Remember we say that God and he had such a close relationship, they walked and talked, and one day they walked so far that God said, well, you know what, you're closer to my home. Come on with me. Okay, just the way that somebody put it. I think he's a spirit. A in a spirit, okay? But how did he walk with them? How did he talk with them? How did he appear to Auburn right now? Was it visible? Was it a form? Or was it the Shekhinah glory? Was there a light there? And you've heard the voice speak out of the light because we know when he taught to Shaol, who becomes Paul, Saul, who becomes Paul, the voice came out of heaven, the bright light, and yet that's all they saw. So really, 
we don't have a full answer. I cannot tell you dogmatically, oh, he put on his human suit and Avram saw facial features, hands, feet, but I can't tell you he didn't either. In some way, his appearance to Avram was very real. Whether it's through a spirit form or not, it was very real. Now, when we see the angel of the Lord appear very soon and Avram, that angel Lord walked with a body that was seen. So it could have been, but whichever way, it's called a theophany, whether it's still in some sort of spiritual form or whether it took on more human form. But this had to been exciting. This is like, oh, I want that, Lord. <laughs> this is being able to tangibly get a taste of what we'll have when we get to heaven. That we'll see him. We will know him in a way that we don't now. Abram got a, a beautiful, upfront and personal God appeared to him. The Lord appeared to him. And when the Lord appeared to him, am I in? Yes, I'm in the right place. He talked to him, and he said to Abram, To your descendants I will give this land. This is the first time he is making this personal now. He told Abram, Go, I'm going to show you a land. We're not told at all why. All we see is Abram didn't question it. He went. He showed full obedience at that point. Here we have him now relating to him in the land, and saying, now what you're seeing, I'm going to give it to your seed. Now that's exciting. This is something that's going to be for your children. Oh, Abram, who's your children? He don't have any. Thank you. <laughs> he has no children at this point. So what Abram is hearing, he's going to have to take by faith. Oh, my wife and I, we're going to yet have an offspring. We're going to have a child. This child is going to inherit this land. That's pretty exciting. I think that would be thrilling to have God come in a form and tell you something about the future in that way. Why he doesn't do it as much today, I fully believe is because we have the Word of God to teach us. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. So God is relating to us, personal and upfront, speaking to us in our circumstances, telling us what we need to know for our future, guiding our steps in the way that we go. But Abram didn't have the Spirit of God dwelling in him, not at this point. We're the ones privileged for that in the time that we live in. So here the Lord comes to him in a very, very special way. And even Yohanan, John 1.18, makes us know this had to have been special back now because in John's day, and that's getting very close to when the time is when we do see Yeshua. Um, whoops, I'm having trouble here. When we do see Yeshua walking in human form on this earth, and we know that he was virgin born, uh, so we know he was fully man and fully God at the same time. But John chapter 1, it takes us all the way back to the beginning in verse 1, in the beginning was the word, who told us in verse 14 that that word tabernacled among men and was referring to Yeshua Jesus putting on the human suit so that he could relate to humanity and, and save humanity. This, the second Adam taking um, up where the first Adam blew it, for lack of a more adult word. In verse 18, we're told no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Yeshua, Jesus, explains Jehovah the Father to us. He, in essence, puts a face on the Father. We wouldn't know anything about the Father except He told us, I come in the power of the Father, I fulfill the will of the Father, I do what the Father tells me to do. So He gives us a bit of an understanding of what the Father is like and what He is. So to have the Lord appear to Avram is very special, very exciting. And it has to be referring in some way to, I think, a spiritual essence. Not that he couldn't have taken on a form that, that was seen, but because of what happens in the book of Shemot, in the book of Exodus, I tend to think this was more of a um, spiritual sight, more like the Shekinah glory at this time, because I don't see it quite introduced in the way when he takes on more human form and we know it. But I certainly can't argue that. If you want to believe that it was more human-like, 
That's fine. Just know it was God in that human form. What I'm referring to in Shmo, in Exodus chapter 33, you may be familiar with it. I have talked about it somewhat before in other classes. And, uh, whoops, okay. Here we go. Exodus 33, we're going to look at verse 18. Because if John tells us no man has seen God, then what happened here in Exodus 33, starting with verse 18, where we read, Then Moshe said, I pray you, he's talking to God, show me your glory. I want to see you, Lord. That's what Moses was saying. And he said, I myself, God speaking, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me. You shall stand there in the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you'll see my back, as this version says it, but my face shall not be seen. Mm -hmm. Okay, what God's telling us is he is so brilliant, so bright. If Moshe saw him face on in that full glory, he would burn up. He burned up, at least his eyes blinded, that would be it. So God's going to shield him in a way that he can see something. He can get a glimpse, he can get an idea, but not the fullness of it. And if you've been with me, you know the Hebrew tells us that what Moshe saw is that which was left behind. So God passed by and the glory that was left behind, because he's glowing, that's what... Moshe saw and even that was enough to make his whole face shine with such a, a glory countenance that they shielded Moshe's face when he came down the mountain to to be among the others what an experience that must have been but again if Moses couldn't see his face full on and live and <coughs> survive it then Avram also couldn't see the Lord in quite the same way you and I see each other I think he was more of a spirit. It could have been more of a spirit. It could have had some form that, that let him know, you know, because we're made in God's image. So, yeah, but does that mean that God's got this much form that we have? No, because we know he's not. He's able to be everywhere at once. We cannot do that. So here's where we just walk it a bit by faith in here. We don't fully understand. One day when we're home, I don't think we'll have to ask. I think we'll say, oh, I get that now. <laughs> But, but then when he comes and tells Abraham that Sarah's going to have a child, then he come as a person? That's when we see him as the angel of the Lord, and we're going to see that Abram saw three men coming to leave, and he yet stood before the Lord. That so could by be that Jesus, point, right? That could be Jesus. It could said. be Jesus in God's form. This could have been also because we use the word interchangeably. Mm -hmm. but, but yes, I believe it does come to a point where we do get a little more picture of what it was like <coughs> when Yeshua Jesus was on this earth. You know, we know they saw him, but again, his glory was, was shrouded, I'll put it that way. So just something to think about, something to let your mind work on for a while, and don't be afraid to ask the Lord to give you a taste of his divine glory just like Moshe asked. I'm not opposed to asking. God okay. likes to give to his children what they ask for. <laughs> I want more of you, Lord. I, I want to shine like he did, not for me to be seen, but for you all to see the glory of the Lord also. Okay. That'd be cool. Because when was it that, was it him and, and Adam that sat and broke bread? And sat down and ate? I mean, had wine not, or whatever? I, I think you're thinking of the 70 that went up with Moshe after the time I just read to you. And they had a meal up there together with the Lord in the mountain. And yes, yeah, and again, that's a taste of the future, you know, so yes. But at this point, I can't tell you because the scripture only says the Lord appeared. So I just, I just want you to have fun working on that for a while, <laughs> okay? What? You just want our brain to work. I want your brains to work, exactly. I want the brain engaged when we're reading. Because too often what we've read time and time again, we can go on, on road. How many of you have been driving your car the same route for a million times 
and all of a sudden you get somewhere and you think, did I stop at that stoplight? You know, I don't remember passing that street, but we did it on autopilot. I don't want you reading the scripture on autopilot. That's my whole point. I want to rattle the cage and say, hey, wake up. What did this look like? I want to know what it looked like in the Garden of Eden. Me too. I want to know what it was like when God came and spoke to them in the cool of the evening. It was in the spirit. I think he was in more I the think, spirit. I think so because that was before the fall and everything. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you. But again, we're thinking. We're wondering. I want to know. <laughs> so, ask and you shall receive, right? If I get anything, I'll let you know. But again, if it's not the word of God, I will tell you. This is Rochelle's thoughts, and what you've just gotten is my thoughts. It could be this, it could be this. You're free to, to take that to the Lord and ask Him to confirm in your heart how you believe it was, if it matters to you. We're going to go on to the next part. So the Lord's appear to him. That had been special right there. He had us sat up and taken notice. If the Lord suddenly appears to us today, it's going to be, yes, Lord, your servant hears. You know, we're going to be in a reverent voice. Yes, we're going to be in a reverent position. We're going to fall on our face. We're going to be waiting to hear what he has to say. And what does he say to Abram? He says, to your descendants, I will give this land. Now notice, not to Abram himself. And we are going to find out, even though in chapter 13, he does promise it to Abram, Abram never possessed it. He was what we would call a pilgrim and a stranger in the land. How do we know that? We never see him where it, the land of Israel becomes his possession. Not yet. I have to put that in there. But go with me to Hebrews 11 and verse 13. Hebrews 11 we know is our faith chapter. I call it our hall of faith. I'm not alone in that nor original in it, but I like it. It fits. We have such an example of those who walk by faith, Auburn being one of them. In verse 13 of Hebrews 11, talking about Abram, talking about others, uh, Abram was mentioned in verse 8. By faith, Abram, Abram, Abraham, because he had his name changed, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Okay, he lived as an alien. Anybody know what an alien is? Not from that place. Not from that place. They're a foreigner. We had our beloved uh, Rabbi Maurice Levy come from Morocco before we ever knew him. He hadn't been in the U.S. long, and he discovered garage sales, and he loved them. <laughs> so he went to a garage sale. He's got very broken English, a very heavy accent, and the woman that was having garage sales strikes up a conversation with him because of his foreign accent. And she asked him, where are you from? He says, I'm a lion. And he, yeah, she looked at him, and she's thinking, I don't know any country named Lion, and I don't know, you know, and so she asked him to repeat, and he again said, I'm a lion. And she worked on that, and she, as he would say later, she must have thought to herself, well, I didn't hear of any animals escaping from the zoo today. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, as she continued talking with him, she realized, oh, you're an alien. <laughs> In his accent, he was telling her he was a lion. But he was saying, I'm an alien. I don't belong here. I'm a foreigner here. He did uh, get his citizenship in time, but at that point, he was a foreigner. He could have said, I'm a foreigner. He, he could have said, but he probably didn't know that word in English either. <laughs> he was a riot. Even years later, communicating with him was always uh, <laughs> entertaining. I'll put it that way. Anyway, my point here is Avram didn't possess it. Show me scripture where it says, says that Avram possessed, past tense, the land of Israel. And I will tell you, you're not reading from the same Bible I'm reading from. The closest we get is he buys the cave of Machpelah, where he buries his wife, and where the other patriarchs are buried to this day. But that's the only part. So we know there's something coming, because God is faithful to his word. But verse 13 tells us, we've talked about Abraham in um, the earlier verses, 8 through 10, I think I read you. Verse 13 says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So, what we're reading here is God promised Abram this land, but he also 
we see, and as scripture often does, it has more than one meaning. It's got a double meaning, a near and a far. He also, by faith, spiritually saw a land that was his, a city. He was looking for a city that God showed him that was going to be his residence. We read that as we go on. Is it right here? Okay. If I can't find it, just a second, and I'll, it'll come up in my notes. Um, oh, it's right there. It's right there. I just needed to keep reading. Okay, so I read you 13. Um, and by the way, if you wonder what a pilgrim is, a pilgrim, a stranger, um, what other words do we use? That's not a drifter. That's not a nobody. That's not somebody that just exists flippy floppy. A pilgrim has a destination in sight. This, what we're seeing about Avram is he was on a pilgrimage. He was on a journey. He was following God. He saw by faith there is a certain city. That's going to be my eternal home. And here we get it described here. Um, verse, we've got in verse 13, strangers and exiles on the earth. Verse 14, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. There is a country promised to Avram. And they indeed, if they've been thinking of that country from where they went, where they came from, they had opportunity to return. If Auburn was saying, oh, I miss my home, I, I'm, I, that's going to be my country, he could have gone back home. He could have gone back to Ur of the Chaldees. That wasn't what he was looking for. We read on, verse 15, if, if indeed, oh, I just read 15, sorry, 16. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It's still not the verse I want. There's a verse that says, Abram looked for a city whose maker um, was God. Um, it's going to come up, or it's in a different version that, that I read. There it is. There it is. Verse 10. I apparently forgot to read verse 10 to you. He was looking forward to the city with permanent foundations of which the architect and the builder is God. So even though God's showing him an earthly area of land that's going to be possession for his family, God was showing him something greater, a spiritual city, a city that God built, not made with human hands. God's the architect, and that's going to be Avram's future permanent dwelling. Keep that in mind when those of you who are smart, who have studied ahead, know in chapter 15 that God shows Avram something even more. And we know that it was talking about his spiritual, and by faith he believed in what God showed him, the, the, the gospel message and a permanent home in heaven. This is, we're beginning to see, God's teaching him, God showing him. Come see a land, I'll show you, Avram. Oh, but let me show you a spiritual home. You know, God uses so in often. Hebrews 11 chapter. Yes, Hebrews 11. Start with about verse 8 and just keep reading till Where? you get Hebrews 11, uh -huh. verse 8. And just, you can read all through because it talks about a couple others that won't hurt. Um, work, read through, for what we just talked about, read through verse 16, but he's still talking about Abraham and Isaac in verse 17. But my point is God will often use object lessons in your life to teach you spiritual lessons that you see on a higher level. We want to see with our spiritual senses. We want to hear with ears tuned to God. We want to have our eyes open, no veil of blindness, so we see fully the spiritual. And when we do, we're seeing a greater than than what's here on this earth. And that's what I'm bringing out to you when the Lord appeared to Abram. Wow. And then what he said to him, wow. And it had have gotten him excited because it was saying, you think this is beautiful, this is for, for your, your, your physical seat, but I've got even a greater for you and those who will be in faith like you. Yes? Okay, but in, in uh, verse 13 it says, all of these died in faith. So who, who is he talking about? Abraham and the others that he's mentioned. Abraham was promised that city, but he didn't get to that city until he died. Oh, okay. He, okay. Yeah, but he died in faith believing. You know, if, if we talked to Avram on his deathbed, and somebody said, well, Avram, didn't God promise you a special city? 
Auburn would have said yes, and I still believe that I will be in that city. The same way that God, I mean, Avram, didn't God promise you also the land of Israel? Yes, and I believe there will be a day when I will inherit that. And we know when Messiah sits on the throne and the promises are fulfilled to Avram, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov, to David, and others, that's when the, that fulfillment will come. That's why for those who don't want to believe in a millennial kingdom, with Israel as head nation and Yeshua Jesus sitting on the throne in earthly Jerusalem, then they're taking what God has promised and they're taking it away from the Jewish people. They do this and they take it and put it in the church and say, oh, it's the churches now because Israel blew it. She rejected her Messiah. Well, God didn't say that. God didn't say because you didn't fully understand or because you rebelled or because you rejected then you're off the table and I'm going to do this. No, that group that he brought in to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy, where are their promises? Does he promise the church, the land, physical land called Israel? No, he never does. He promises them a greater, new Jerusalem, heavenly <clears throat> Jerusalem, all of heaven, reigning with him, coming back to earth to reign with him in that millennial time in that earthly Israel. But it's not, the earthly Jerusalem is not your home. You are a pilgrim, like Avram. You're moving to your permanent home and you will get there via your departure from earth. However it comes, rapture, death, however it comes, that's when you'll graduate, get your permanent address, your forever home. Thank God it's not here. But for Israel, who's been promised an earthly home also. God saying, I'll never make a full end of the nation of Israel. I'll make a full end of other nations that come against my people, but I'll never make a full end of Israel. God has to keep those promises, or you better worry about your eternal status. <coughs> because if God can say, oop, I'm going to pull it back from Abraham, then God can say, oop, I'm going to pull it back from the church. But is that our God? No. God never does that. He is faithful to his word. And when he makes what kind of covenant? Conditional or unconditional? Unconditional. Unconditional. He made unconditional. I will, God said. Mm -hmm. Now there is other covenants where he said, if you will, then I will. Mm -hmm. This was an unconditional, I will. So I trust God. I take it to the bank. I believe in my permanent, eternal home. I believe that I am an ambassador. An ambassador doesn't live in their home country. They live somewhere else representing their, their government, their whole city, whatever you want to call it, to the people that they've been sent to be a representative to. That's what every believer is. Your home is heaven. That's your eternal place. That's where your citizenship is. You are not an earth dweller. You are a pilgrim on this earth. You are just passing through. This is not your home. That's your home. And I can take it to the bank and count on it because I know the very fact that there is an Israel in 2022 is because God's faithful, because God's keeping his word, because God said, I won't let them make the full end of you. Otherwise, Hitler would have succeeded. The Crusaders, the Inquisition, all of these times all through history would have succeeded, but God won't let them succeed. The, the Arab nations right now, the PLO and others who want to push Israel into the sea right now, no good Jew. If the only good Jew is the dead Jew, and they say it. God won't allow them. Yes, there's a lot that are going to lose their lives in the tribulation, but God will keep a remnant that will come through. They will possess the earthly land promises that we're going to be already in our home and we're going to come back and rule and reign with him. Yes, Rhonda, unmute yourself. Yay. Okay, when we hear the term earth dwellers, I remember us reading that in Revelation. Is earth dwellers exclusive to the tribulation times, that term? No. And I love it. It's exactly where I wanted your mind to go. I was wanting to leap up and say, are you hearing this? 
go with me to Revelation 3.10 because Rhonda gave me the excuse. I know our class isn't all about this, but this is important because this is where people get derailed and they can get their faith shaking because they're not staying on the Word of God. Revelation, and this, Revelation 3? 3.10, yes. Okay. We're going to look at it a little earlier, but 3.10 is the key verse. Um, but this, this is where I'm very, very strong on let Scripture interpret Scripture. And yes, we see a continuation of those words, and it's made very clear in chapter 3. What we have in 2 and 3 is seven churches' <laughs> messages given to the seven. Most of them are told you're doing something good, but God has something against them. They need to straighten up, or there's a coming judgment. When we get to the Philadelphia church, we don't have any condemnation. They're on fire for the Lord. They're serving the Lord. They're sending out missionaries to tell the, the world about the Lord. We don't see condemnation. We don't see judgment. We see promise. Okay, in that, in Revelation 3, the church that we're talking about starts with verse 7. The angel of the church in Philadelphia, um, this, the one writing is holy and true. I want to skip because I don't want, if we were here in Revelation, I'd give you word by word. I've taught this. If you don't have it and you need it word for word, ask me and I'll get you a copy, okay? Or we'll take a, another time away from Wednesday and we'll teach it again. Now, verse... Well, verse 9, I know your deeds, open door that no one can shut. You have a little power because you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. And then he tells that those who are coming against you, the synagogue of Satan, the ones who are not the true Jews, which means truly in faith believing, that they're going to come and bow down at your feet. Um, and they're going to know that I have loved you. This is for the ones standing in opposition to you and your faith. God one day is going to reveal to them, you have the truth, and they're going to bow down at the God that you worship. And they're going to know that you are God's people, that God loved you because you came into that right relationship with him. Verse 10, because you kept my word, sorry, because you kept the word of my perseverance, you have persevered in, what, in my word, in your faith. I will also keep you, the believers, from the hour of testing. Now that hour is a specific hour. If I'm going to keep you from, and I name something specific, then it's specific from the hour of testing. The hour which is about to come on the whole world. In the Bible, the only thing that we know, apart from the flood which took everyone out in judgment except for Noah in faith who made it through in the ark, the only other time in Scripture anything is mentioned, because this is telling you it's about to come, you know it's not talking about the flood. The flood already came. The flood's already done. There's something about to come, and it's going to be on the whole world. It's not going to be just on Israel. It's not going to be in Utah. <laughs> it's not going to be in Swahili or Africa or Timbuktu. It's going to be the entire world world okay and you could well no maybe you better not I'll probably knock it over this entire world is about to come onto into a time of testing what's another word for testing tribulation okay there's a worldwide tribulation coming oh I think we've heard about that all the way through in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, from Ezekiel, from the prophets, Zechariah. We've read about this time, and all the scriptures together, we use the name the tribulation. The tribulation will be on the whole earth. It's not going to be just on Israel. Battle of Armageddon is in the land of Israel. Everything is centered around what's happening in Israel, but it's going to cover the entire world. The whole world, in fact, the, the, the whole earth shakes at one point because of they're in the tribulation. They're in this time of testing that's come on the whole earth. So it makes it very clear. It hasn't happened yet in John's day. It is coming. It's going to come on the whole world to test those who, and your scripture either says, who dwell on the earth or who are the earth dwellers. Okay? Makes it very clear. Earth dwellers. Now, show me a scripture, any scripture from Genesis to Revelation that says that a believer is an earth dweller. 
Yeah. The lights come on. Okay. I love it. I love it. She's getting it. Yes. No. What does it say about those who are believers? Where does it say our sins of heaven? I'm sorry? Citizen of heaven. Thank you. Citizen of heaven. That's what we are called. Those who are believers, our citizenship is in heaven. I'm fighting. I'm going to grab my phone because it's, I think it's in the Corinthians. But I want to get the verse for you. That's who we are. So yes, earth dweller refers to people on earth who are not believers. They are called earth dwellers. Believers are never called um, citizenship, are never called earth dwellers. We are told our citizenship is in heaven, and that's why I just told you that we are ambassadors, and that's what the scripture calls us also. Okay, Philippians 3.20, that's where we want to go right now. This is why it's good to go over things so that you're fresh in your mind. Philippians 3 and verse 20, and I will read it for you. In Revelation. In Revelation, well, we were in Revelation 3.10. Now to see that we're not an earth dweller, Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay? So, Philippians is calling us citizens of heaven. We are eagerly waiting for our Savior to appear and take us home. We haven't gone home yet. That's why we call heaven home, because we're a pilgrim passing through it. We're on our journey. We're going to end up in our home. Our home is not on earth. We are not earth dwellers. So there is a stark contrast to the difference between being an earth dweller and being a citizen of heaven. And everyone who believes in Yeshua Jesus is that citizen that belongs to heaven. Um, if you go up earlier in Philippians, it will tell you that. I think maybe even... Um, well, 21 tells us that's when he will transform our body from this humble state into conformity with his body of glory. That means we get rid of this body that gets hurt, gets cancer, dies, you know, all that's gone, and we'll have the Lord's body, that perfect, glorious body. Yes, Rhonda? So that further confirms that the church is gone, right? Yes, yes, exactly. That further confirms if just because it's been raised and just in a nutshell okay when we go back to revelation 310 back to where we were and it's talking about that um that tribulation that's coming on the whole earth that we know is the tribulation period when we read here and i have to find it okay i will keep you from the hour of testing the Greek tells you, I will keep you away from the edge of. Now, Greek is very, very particular. I should have my little mouse in my box. If you remember when you've been with me, all your propos sorry, all your prepositions, I guess I'm thinking political, all your prepositions are related to that box. I could go dig it up, but I, I'm not going to. I've got a, I got a box here. It looks tacky, but it'll work. Okay? I'm putting my hand in the box. I'm putting my hand around the box. My hand is over the box. My hand is under the box. When the Greek says, I will keep you away from the edge of, that means that I can't come up Stand on a slippery slope, and how many of you had mamas telling you when you were walking on a mountain trail, get away from the edge, get away from the edge, because she didn't want you to accidentally slide down to your demise. God's saying, you're not going to accidentally slide into the tribulation. I'm going to keep you away from the edge of it. That's what he is telling the believers here. He does not say you will go into it and come out of it. He says, I'll keep you out from the edge of it. So, number one layer, we are not earth dwellers. Number two layer, we're kept from the edge of. And in this verse alone is a third layer. Um, i got to get back into the verse. Verse 10, uh, I'll keep you from the hour testing. About to come on the whole earth. Okay, okay. Um, I guess the third layer, the two were together. The, the tribulation, the one that's coming on the face of the whole earth, because we have tribulation. There were those who thought they were in the tribulation in World War II. And I understand why they thought that, because of the horrors of what was going on. But 
this tribulation is coming is going to make that look like a walk through the, the park. And that happened in a specific area, not over the whole earth. This is over the whole earth. So um, we're promised to be kept away from the edge of, we're promised to be kept from the tribulation. What else can it be? It, they'll say, oh, well, you're kept from God's wrath. Well, then go to 1 Thessalonians and you will see that we are kept from God's wrath by salvation. Once we're kept by his wrath from salvation, then how can we enter into wrath? No, and the whole tribulation period is that period of that time that the, the wrath of God is poured out. It's more fully poured out in the second half, but the whole tribulation is God's judgment. It's not man's for three and a half years and then becomes God's. The whole thing is God's judgment on a sin-soaked world. Okay, so, the, and I could, if I could get my memory going, I could give you even more. I'm just trying to make it real quickly. Um, the verse 10 gives no room in my personal opinion, and I can back it up with many more scriptures, that there is not a midpoint when you're taken out of. Okay? Israel is told, you will go into the tribulation. I will bring you out of it. You will come out of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jacob's trouble is another word for the tribulation. The indignation is another word. Tribulation and indignation are interchangeable in Scripture. So if you look at Israel's Scripture, you're going to go, Oh, no. I'm going to go into the tribulation and I'm going to come out of the tribulation. When did you become Israel? The same way that the church didn't be, replace Israel that we just talked about, you didn't become Israel. The nation of Israel will go through that judgment time, and God will see to it that she won't end there. Because God said, I'll never let them make an end to you. I will keep you so Israel will come through the tribulation. But God's speaking to Israel. It, you, the whole Bible is for us, but the whole Bible isn't written to us. In the same way that we're not under law, we're under grace. We're saved by grace. We're not saved by keeping the commandments. That was the school, uh, that was the tutor to point us and show us we can't keep God's law. We need salvation. I can give you an example. Under law, it says forgive and then you'll be forgiven. Under grace, Ephesians 4.32 says forgive because you have been forgiven. There are differences. We know God deals differently at different times with mankind because we're studying those right now. And we're saying God did it to show man, I could put you in a perfect environment and you blow it. I can let you be led by human government and you blow it. I can let you be led by your conscience and you blow it. Every way you blow it. That's why we see these differences. But God says there's one way of salvation from the first Adam to the last human. One way of salvation. One name under heaven whereby we are saved and that's the name Yeshua Jesus so Israel God has told you this land is yours stay in obedience and reap the blessings consequences oh yeah you'll get thrust out of this land if you don't turn at my correction well Israel's been thrust out of her land a number of times we see it through her history Finally, she's going to come to the point where she cries out, Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. She's finally going to get right spiritually as a nation. That's the, the saved remnant that will go into the millennial kingdom right at the end of the tribulation. But unfortunately, many of the Jewish people have lost their lives during the tribulation, many Gentiles also, because they have not come under God's umbrella of salvation. Okay, but Israel will go through. Israel will come out. We never read that the church has judgment put on them. The church has come into salvation through Yeshua taking our judgment on Him. We're under the blood. We're saved by grace. When we have come into salvation, we have been free from the judgment that will fall. The tribulation judgment, we're also free from the, the judgment that will cast us into hell, which is where every single one of us deserves. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You, in your grace, do not give me, well, in your mercy, you don't give me 
what I deserve, and by your grace, you give me what I don't deserve. That's amazing grace. But it's very, very clear if you keep who the verses are to. When God's speaking to the church, he uses different words than he does to Israel because his program is different with them. Now, he doesn't give the church the right to go sin. He doesn't say, oh, you got it, you're saved, go eat, drink, be merry, do whatever you want. No. Remember, I even brought out in Luke 19, you're to work until he comes. You are to be faithful. You are to be obedient to him. Are there consequences? Yes. You get taken out to the woodshed. <laughs> you're still his kid. You're still going to inherit your promises just like an earthly family. If daddy and mom had put in the will that, that the child is to inherit all of their earthly goods when they die, that child can get in trouble with them. That child can get a spanking. That child can be put in time out. That child can even be sent to live with somebody else. But that child is still the child of his parents. And then when his parents die, that will is still going to give their possessions to that child. So what God's promised his child who's come into saving faith through the blood of Yeshua Jesus, we're promised to be joint heirs with Yeshua. What does Yeshua inherit? Everything. That's our heritage. Everything. We don't get confined to just the land. We've got all of these promises, all these spiritual promises, all these glories. Home is heaven. Hallelujah. So keep it separate, and I don't think you'll have any problem. If you have a problem with the search scripture, ask yourself, who is it written to? Because if you read somebody else's mail, <laughs> do I need to finish the sentence? Dora. Okay, but then the non-believers that are left behind, and I mean, the ones that haven't taken the mark, they have a chance to go through tribulation also, right? Yes, and most of them will be, be saved. Most of them will lose their lives, but there will be, I'm sure, there will be also Gentiles who make it through the tribulation, hit out or whatever, because they put their faith in the Lord. And he, he and his ultimate plan did not, did not, their, their days, all our days are by God, you know, when we are born and when we die. And he's, he will see to it that there are those Gentiles also who will go into the millennial kingdom. I don't believe it's just Jews that are saved at the end. I think it's both. You know, the sheep and goat judgment that we see to go into the millennium casts out those who were not believers. They will not go in. The millennium will start with only those who believe and are still in their earthly bodies. They didn't die. They weren't martyred. They survived somehow. Like I say, hiding out or whatever. But they're believers. The problem is they'll have children because they still have their physical body. Those children have to get saved the same way we have to get saved today. They're going to have a wonderful world to live in. Satan's bound. He's not able to, to come and whisper in their ear and deceive and sow doubt and trick. But man, amazingly, has a rebellious heart toward God. And in the end, after a thousand years, so you've got in a thousand years, look at how many children we see our people in this time age have had, you know, that lived 500, 600, 700 years, and we see child after child after child. They're gonna, there's going to be many born during the millennium. They're going to replenish and be filling the earth. At the end of that thousand year reign, when God lets Satan out of the abyss, <coughs> out of the pit where he's been bound, He's going to go through the whole face of the earth. He's going to say, hey, come follow me. We're going to get rid of that God. I'm going to be God. We're going to have a blast. You know, set me up and you'll never regret it. And sadly, it says that it says the dust of the, 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 the sound of the earth, however that expression goes, there's going to be so many we can't count them that are going to follow Satan, they're going to come up, literally to come in the face of God. I think they're coming to the earthly throne and the heavenly throne because with Satan they're going to go into his domain, they think, and dethrone God. And he thinks he's finally got it, what he's wanted from the very beginning. I'm going to sit in God's seat. I'm going to get the worship. And the fools that think that they want a, him for their God, where is the love in Satan? He tells people now to send their, their children to be martyrs, to get blown up, 
so that they can have 72 virgins in heaven and they wake up in the fire of hell. That's not love. Where does Satan ever do anything good for a person? Where does Satan show love and care and grace and mercy? He's the epitome of the exact opposite of that. But he's going to fool them because they've got that rebellious heart. See, God didn't make them a puppet any more than he made us puppets. And they've got a chance to show what's in their heart. Well, you say, then why didn't they show it all along? Because in the millennium, when Yeshua is sitting on the throne and something wrong happens, judgment follows. If you judge with a rod of iron, people stay in line. So if little Johnny sees Jack over here, a harsh punishment meted out on him by the Lord because he did something bad, little Johnny's going to say, mm, I think I'll stay on this side of the line. You know, in, in the foreign countries now where they chop off a hand if you're caught stealing, do you know how much theft they have in that country? Just about nothing. You know, it takes one hand being cut off, shown publicly, and everybody's going to say, hey, I want my hands. I'm not going to do that. So they've stayed in line out of, i got to do this because I don't want that consequence. But my heart isn't there. It's like the little boy who was told he had to go sit in the corner, and he finally sits down because his mom's told him repeatedly, sit down, sit down. And he finally sits down and he says, well, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Well, that's basically what they're doing. They're sitting down on the outside, but they're standing up in rebellion on the inside, and they're given that chance to show. God doesn't make anyone have to worship Him. God doesn't make anyone have to live with Him. God doesn't make anyone have to have all the glories, all the riches, and all the graces that He freely gives. And sadly, I don't get it, I cannot understand it, but so many will choose to follow Satan, and yet that's when God says, that's it. And he will, out of heaven, destroy them on the spot, and they will go now into the great white throne judgment, stand before God to receive what they deserve in hell forever. What a sad ending. But every believer who, who has stayed with the Lord in that millennial time will continue on. They'll continue on. But we, we won't be earthbound. We're not earth dwellers. They're going to be earthbound. Unless the Lord makes them able to not live on earth, they're, they're stuck living on earth. I say stuck. That'll be a wonderful place to live. But we have the greater blessings. We have the spiritual blessings. We are joint heirs, Romans 8, with our Lord who inherits all. God says, you sit here till I put everything under your feet. He inherits it all. We are joint heirs with him. Wow. We, what glory. And anybody who thinks heaven is boring, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. And you don't know the heaven I know just from scripture. And that's only a tease. If we knew more, I think we'd be so no worth good on this earth, no earthly good, that we wouldn't be able to stand it. And so God doesn't show us everything. He just gives us a little taste. Any of you have had a glimpse, a taste, of the glory to come, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, does it light a fire in you? You can't wait to get home, and you you're doing you just you just want to get home. Can you imagine if we really knew? I, I, God, in His mercy, veils the whole and just gives us a little taste, enough to make us want it, enough to light our faces with His glory, like Moshe was lit, and like Abraham had a private, personal intimate conversation with the Lord here. Wow. Okay, I took a right turn. I'm not going to call it a left turn. I took a right turn. <laughs> Did I cover everything? Is there any questions, comments? Forgive me if I'm on my sandbox, but oh yeah, I'm on my sandbox. And Oh, and by the way too, if you are struggling with the pre, mid, and post, it doesn't matter for your salvation. Oh, I love it. Thank you. It doesn't matter for salvation. Salvation's in Yeshua, Jesus alone, no matter what your end time view is. It's not dependent on that. So it's not worthy of us dividing. It's not worthy of us fighting. It's not worthy of us getting into controversies and causing schisms and all of that. But if you are insecure and you are afraid 
I will tell you, perfect love casts out all fear. Fear does not come from the Lord. And if you are fearful of how much am I going to have to go through, you need to get into your word of God and ask God to reveal to you what will speak shalom and peace to your heart. If you struggle with verses, bring them to me if you want, and I will go into the Word of God with you. Having done a full study, I know the verses used for mid-trip. I know the verses used for post-trip. I will show you why I don't see it their way and give you the freedom to make up your own mind. I'm not here to shove Rochelle down your throat. I am here to say, get into the Word of God. Interpret the Word of God by the Word of God. Look at who it's to. Keep in mind what God's plan for Israel is, what God's plan for the church is. And when you do that, I think you will come into a place of 100% complete peace, no matter where you end up with your view. And when you worry about the future in that way, realize, Corey Tim Boom, living with fear in the days of the Holocaust, so panicky that she won't do what's right in that moment when she has to, because they're hiding Jews, and they did get carted off to the camps. She had a right to fear. But her father was trying to encourage her, and he said to her, Corey, when we're going to go on the train, when do I give you your ticket? Do I give it to you here in the house? No, Papa. Do I give it to you halfway to the train? No, Papa. Do I give it to you when we're standing on the train station waiting for the train? No, Papa. You give it to me the moment I'm going to step on the train when I need it. And he said, Corey, that's what God will do for you. Whatever you're going to have to face, you don't need to worry about it ahead of time. The moment you're facing it, God will meet you and give you what you need. And God gave her grace. The fact that she survived what she survived shows God met her all the way. Mm -hmm. It was not easy. It's not easy now. We don't have to look to the tribulation for how bad it's going to be. It's a sick, bad world now. And we all deal with heartaches now. But the Lord will give you whatever you need now. And if you're saying to, to yourself right now, well, Rochelle, I don't have that. I don't have what I need. Then I'm going to tell you, how much time you're spending in His Word and in prayer. Because if you're doing those two things, I guarantee you, your eyes will be opened, your ears will hear, and your need will be met. Can I tell you how? Absolutely not. I'm not God. And I'm not able. But I will tell you, my God never fails. And I'm not saying these words lightly. I'm not here to tell you my sob story. And my story is not anywhere near as bad as someone who's really suffered horrendously in this life. But I'm here to tell you in what's been my heartaches, what's been my troubles, that's where my peace has come from. In the midst of the storm. Not after it's over, but in it and, and through it. God walks, I walk with God every moment. If I'm in a place of fear, if I'm in a place that, that I'm not feeling that and knowing that, then I'm the one that doesn't have my feet where they belong. Stay with the one who is holding your hand, who's picking you up, who's carrying you, who's doing whatever you need. Get into his word. Ask him, give me a verse. I guarantee you he will. Because this word of God covers everything. It's amazing. It fits 2022. It fit 2022 B.C. And it will fit every day A.D. That's our God. Just be ready. That's, That's our all. God. And you how are you ready? In the end time. How ready. are you ready? In the Word and in prayer. In the Word and in prayer. You can never get enough of either of those. <clears throat> Nobody can tell me, oh, I spend enough time in the Word or I spend enough time in prayer because I'll tell you, uh-uh. No, you don't. Nobody ever can. <laughs> so, okay. Now I'm really needing to off my sandbox. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Are we still in the uh, 12th chapter? We're still in Genesis 12, and this is partly why. Let's run back, and we're going to see what God did say to Avram in Genesis chapter 12. I hope you found worth in where we went today. I trust the Holy Spirit led in that discussion might be for just one, but that's okay. The Lord gave some of his, can I say, best, in quotes, best sermons to an audience of one. If he's spoken to your heart today, that's how precious you are to him. He gave you class today. So, and not me. He gave you his word. Verse, um, 
we're for seven still, I think. Have we done all of seven? The Lord appeared. Okay, he promised it to your descendants, okay? And I've already raised the question there. He, he promises it also to Abram, who will not possess it in his lifetime, but by faith believed, and we will see the day that he will possess it coming in millennial reign. Um, so, what did Abram do? He was so excited. I love it. I love his response. He's been touched by the Lord. He's had a conversation with the Lord. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. He worshiped the Lord. He praised him. When we are touched by the Lord, that's what we do also. You hear the praises, the hallelujahs that come out of our mouths. Absolutely. Build yourself an altar to the Lord. Avram did it literally because they built altars in those days. And I'm not telling you to go get the stones in your yard and light something on fire. <laughs> but you can build an altar in your heart. And you can fall down and worship before the Lord. And you can sing his praises and his hallelujahs. And I'll tell you, we need to do that whether everything is glorious and beautiful or whether we're in the midst of that storm. Praise will lift you whichever way and whichever time. So, I love what Abram did. He showed his love to the Lord. He showed his faith and believing. He's looking forward to it. He builds him an altar, and I've still lost my place. There it is. Okay. We're ready for verse 8. What do you know? Then he, Abram, proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, or Beit El, and pitched his tent with Beit El on the west, and it says Ai is Ai in the Hebrew, on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Are you seeing a habit here? Are you seeing something habitual? Verse 7, he built an altar to the Lord. Now he's moved on because remember he's supposed to go, the Lord's showing him the land. He didn't tell him stop, put up residence here. So he moves on, but the very next place he comes to, once again, he builds an altar to the Lord. He is showing the Lord has first place in his heart and in his life. He is showing that he wants to worship and honor his God wherever he goes. And it's very interesting that Beit El, Beth El in the Hebrew means house of God. So he's come into the area where, where the house of God is built literally by him. But notice also A-I-E -I -A -I in your English. In Hebrew, that means a heap of ruin. A heap of ruin. A heap of what? A heap of ruin. I picture in my mind, make a whole heap of garbage. That's what it's saying. It's, it's a heap, you know, something heaping, and it's all ruined. It's all worthless. So you've got the house of God, and you've got trash mounding in my mind. You can put whatever you want there as long as it's ruined. You can put broken buildings, broken toys, you know, whatever you want. But it's ruined over here, and it's the house of God over here. And Abram is between those two. It, he's dwelling between the two, and I think very much that's typical of the sphere of the believer. We live between those two. When we're doing well and right with our God, we're living in Beit El, the house of God. But when we lean into our own physical, and I don't mean flesh, I mean non-spiritual, then we are headed for ruin. We're going to be in a heap of ruin, a heap of hurt. It's not going to be a lovely place to live, especially if we're moving in that area out of rebellion. Well, God, you didn't do what I want, so I'll see you another day. Look out, folks. Look out. But just as Avram was a pilgrim, he was able to keep moving. He moved according to God's will. You can run back into the house of God, build yourself an altar again, and do it the right way. Okay? Yes? So is he the only one that did that? That's all we've read about in scripture so far, Noah, when he came out of the, the ark into the new land, built an altar. Chapter 7. But what we do, don't see here, yeah, verses 7 and 8 are the two altars in chapter 12. What we don't see here is anybody else building an altar. We don't see Lot building an altar. Yeah. We see Avram, we see God dealing with Avram alone, and we see Avram acting alone. The, both of them, like the altar and then this heap of ruin. Well, they, were, they were cities. Remember, the Canaanites are living in this land. So they were cities. But even by their names, we can see. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm sure that 
the house of God got named the house of God. I think it, I think later it's called this here, but it, this could be a note from one because all five books were written by Moses. You know that he he took the records of the genealogies and all that. But remember, sometimes they fill in something because they know. So when we're going to see later when Bethel gets named Bethel, and it, the fact is called that here is to show us this is where they were. We know it's called Bethel today. Kind of like um, Israel, originally the airport you flew into was in Lut. Everybody says, oh, wait a minute, Israel's main airport's been, always been Tel Aviv. Yes, Tel Aviv's ancient name is Lut. So I could write something over here, and I could use the name Lud, or I could use the name Tel Aviv because I know it's talking about the same place. Mm -hmm. They gave us the name Bethel because they know that's the name it's going to become known by. By the time Moshe is putting it together, it is known by that name. So it, it's like a, a we, we know we have a little bit of, of um, <coughs> What's the word we want? We, not just foresight, because it, it's, it has already happened. We have the facts because it has happened. So looking back, he could give it the right name. I can tell you it was 12 miles north of Jerusalem that he's moved now down from Shechem to Bedel, that area. He's moved down about 20, 25 miles. So he's moving. He's traveling. Okay? Does that answer your question? Now, according to the tenth of birth, it says that on the ninth verse, Abram journeyed and going on towards the south, and there was a phantom, phantom in the land of Abram and went down into Egypt. Which is showing you the south traveling, but you're ahead of us because I've still got to get a little more out of verse 8 before we get down <laughs> to verse 9. So let me take you, I think I missed it in the beginning. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. He proceeded. He removed himself from where he was. He moved on. Now, why did he move on? It could be, some will tell you, because he needed more pasture for his flocks. It could be because he wanted to move further away from heathen worship. But I think also he was still being obedient. God said, I want to show you the land. He hasn't covered the land yet. So I think he's moving forward just out of obedience to what God told him to do. But the benefit of it would be also there'd be new pastures for his flocks, and he would be putting more distance from the heathens that are around, the, I presume, Ai, Ai being a heap of ruin, probably was filled with idolatry. You know, it was not a place that, that honored God, and Bethel will become. But anyway, so he's on the move, and it says, and he pitched his tent. Pitching his tent is again showing you um, that he was a pilgrim, that he's on that pilgrim walk that we talked about. He's living like a nomad, but he's, he's got a place in mind. The nomads often don't have a place in mind. They live, you know, in an area until that there's no more uh, pasture for their flocks, and then they'll pick up a move and they'll just move wherever and however they get. Now, Avram had more of a goal. He was moving toward what God had shown him. Um, but they, anytime they'd move, anytime they'd settle, it would have to be an area that had water and it had pasture for the animals. And probably all of them looked for areas that weren't overrun. In other words, if you're going to come in and you've got a lot of flock, you've got people with you, because he's picked up people along the way. We know that even in, in Haran, he, he picked up people who came along with him. Then he's not going to move into a congested area and start fighting over it. He's going to keep moving out to a little more area where there's room for his flocks, room for his people, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if I read all the way through verses 14 through 16 in Hebrews 11, but that's where we get the heavenly city. So let me just look real quick, take a quick peek there because I want that complete thought for you. Uh, that is not Rochelle's idea, is what the scriptures tell us. So I'm jumping back into Hebrews 11, our chapter of faith. We saw that by faith he looked for the city, that the maker of the city was God. And verses 14 to 16, if I didn't read it earlier, um, I might have. Let me just read it again. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. If indeed they've been thinking of a country that came from, I did read that. They could have returned. But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, because he has prepared them a city. 
So they're moving on saying, no, we're looking for the city God made. And God is saying that he's, they're not going to be ashamed one day for claiming that because he has made them a city. They were right to look for the city because God showed it to them and he told them, when God promises you, he delivers. Okay, so they're, they pitch their tent, and they move. Um, we too, we need to be pilgrims on this earth. Look at 1 Peter 2.11. This will also back up that we're not earth dwellers. First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 11. And in First Peter 2, verse 11, we read, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage, against, which wage war against the soul. Okay? He didn't say anything in there about us belonging to this earth. We don't belong to this earth. And that's why what wars against us is the earthly things. We're to stay away from that. Don't go into the world. Don't let the world be a part of you. You know all those bumper stickers or window stickers not of this world? That's what they're saying. Even though the world wants to entice you, don't give it a moment. Don't give in to your fleshly, to your earthly lust, because you're an alien. You're a stranger. And I guarantee you, believer, I guarantee you, go into that world. You might think it's, it's happy and fun for a time, but I 100% guarantee the end will be miserable. You will regret you ever went. You will be glad to get out of there and back into where God wanted you to be where you're looking and building toward your citizenship in heaven, not on the earth which is not your home. Okay, so there's another proof point that we're not earth dwellers. We're strangers and aliens. We're pilgrims. And we should live as if heaven is our permanent home. Do you want to build your permanent home? Of course, the Lord's the great carpenter, and we know he's building. But do you want to, to join with him in that? How many people would love to construct their home on this earth, make the home the way they want? I guarantee you we women would make a huge kitchen because where does everybody go hang out? <laughs> in your kitchen, no matter how small or how big it is, you'll find we've had 20 people in a tiny kitchen, the rest of the house empty. It never <laughs> fails. If I built my home here on earth, I'd build a big kitchen. You know, and we all have our likings, that, you know, where we would choose to live, what we would choose. Well, in essence, when we're building with God, and when he's building our mansion, what we send up for him, because we don't lay up our treasures here on earth, that's going into our heavenly places. And some liken it to mansions. And they say, you know, we're going to have beautiful mansions because you can get that from the scripture. We know the Lord, whatever he builds, is gorgeous. And it, it's suited to us perfectly. But my point is, too many people want to build a mansion down here on earth and literally work for it, slave, work hours, spend less time with the family and more time at that, that office so they'll have more money to build that house that they're building bigger and better. And they, you know, they've got it all planned. They've got the golden spigots and they've got the, the pool or the sauna or you know, whatever, all these earthly desires. And they, they want to live in plush. They want plush carpets under their feet, and they want all the luxuries, and they think, well, I got a home in heaven. It's good enough. You know, I got my home there. Well, hello. Let's build our mansions up there where it lasts forever, where it really matters. That's where you're going to dwell. This down here can burn up in an instant, and you can't take it with you. So, unfortunately, too many believers have it backward. They're more concerned with building a mansion here and they think they'll be content with a tent in heaven. I want all heaven can give me, and I don't know how God does that. Um, I've got John Corson, a pastor at Applegate Fellowship in Oregon, good pastor. He says he believes that there are degrees in heaven the way there are degrees in hell. That we've said all along, Hitler deserves to suffer more than the sweet little lady that never hurt anybody. In the same way, he said, I believe that when you invest in your spiritual life and you grow up in your spiritual life in that maturity, then you're able to enjoy heaven even greater. Like, take Disneyland for an example. Disneyland pleases the three-year-old, but the 30-year-old sees things all over Disneyland the three-year-old misses. They're still both happy, but the 30-year-old, in his maturity, 
gets a fuller enjoyment. And that's what John said. He thinks heaven's like. He says, I don't want any of my congregation to be three-year-olds. I want you to be 30-year-olds and mature in heaven. And I, I get his point. How God does that, neither John nor I know because Scripture doesn't tell us. But I guarantee you, when you invest in heaven, you'll have the great return on what you've invested. You invest in this earth, you may have it for a time, and you may not. I have a note here. I will sidetrack because I will forget later. For those of you who have page 35 cross-references, you need to add in the 1 Peter 2.11 um, scripture that I just took us to. I did not have that in the cross-references. So on page 35, where it gives chapter 12 and verse 8, add in 1 Peter 2.11, because otherwise if you get home and say, where's that verse, it's not on your paper. Okay? Sorry about that. 1 Peter what? 2.11. We don't have, we don't have, we have page 37. I gave it to you earlier. Oh. And if you don't remember, send me that. It. Okay, then after class I'll get you. You know, you have to tell me what pages you're missing, because if you miss class when I've passed out, I don't remember. And I didn't pass out, I passed out papers. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't pass out. Okay, so, building that altar back in Genesis 12, because I want to be able to complete our thoughts and move us a little more along. Um, building that altar in verse 12 showed that Abram was depending on the Lord. It shows that he wants to worship the Lord. He met the Lord at the altar of sacrifice. He says, I'm laying down my all. I'm giving you my all. And that's how we meet God also. And again, this is the second altar he's built. So this isn't a, oh, he just did it and he doesn't think again. This is his way of life. I think wherever he was going to go, he was going to build an altar and worship God there. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We don't have to go to an external place. But are we building altars? Are we bowing at the altar? Are we putting ourselves on the altar? Because Romans 12.1 tells us that we're to present ourselves a living sacrifice. But where do you put a living sacrifice? You put it on the altar. And that's what we're to be doing, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God, which is only a reasonable service. He's the one that's given us everything and done for us and will do through us. How can we not give him what is his? So that's that we should be living that kind of life also. And in this altar, where we, we have it here in verse 8, it also says that he called on the name of the Lord. I'm running back to verse 8 so I can read it. The last part. There he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. The word for Lord there is our word Jehovah. <coughs> Remember, that's when God is acting in that special relationship with man. So when Abram's calling on his name, the name he's calling on is God, you who said you want a covenant with me, you who said you want me to enter into this intimate relationship with you, you're who I'm worshiping. It's not some God out there that, that I can't fathom and can't understand. This is the one who's making himself intimate, upfront, and personal with Abram. And I guarantee you, if you put yourself on the altar, he will be upfront, personal, and intimate with you also. So, a lot we can learn from Avram. A lot, a lot, a lot. Yet, he was human because if we get far enough, we're going to see a big oops coming. But God still uses him. Verse 9, Avram journeyed on, as Loretta read for us earlier, continuing toward the Negev. That's south. Negev means dry. It's called the Negev to this day. It's the part of Israel that is dry desert to this day. Yet, Israel is learning how to make the dry desert blossom. Dry? Beautiful, yes, means dry, negative, dry. It's also used synonymously for the south. If you're told go south, you're being told go to the negative. The largest southern part of Israel's desert is what's called the negative. By the time Avram comes through the negative, he will have pretty much traveled through the land that God said in verse 1, I will show you. So he's gone from the north all the way down the south when he gets down into the Negev and we're going to see he's poised down toward Egypt, which we all know on the map is below Israel. So he's pretty much traveled through the land. It doesn't mean he's zigzagged and saw it all, but he's gotten an overall taste. He's seen the lush green, he's seen the waters, now he's seen the desert, all part of the land. And here's where we find out what happens in dry land. Verse 10, now there was a famine in the land, 
So Avram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. So <laughs> Sorry, folks, I got shocked. I did not see him coming. <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. He thinks it's his, and he usually can land in there without sliding. But <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> he just went south. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what was I saying? Oh, that, that I was reading the scripture. There was famine in the land. Famine, lack of food. We all understand what that is. And what this is going to do is be a test of Avram's faith. Okay? It, everything's been great. Everything's provided for him. He's, he's got flocks. He's got people. We see. But now he's going to come into a time of famine. Famine means hunger. Famine means there's a lack. Is he going to trust God to supply his need, or is he going to take matters into his own hands? Often, we're going to face famine. I can be talking spiritually here. We, we're in a time that dr we're dry spiritually. We can't see. We can't understand. We don't know. We don't feel. And we say, I'm in a drought spiritually. Well, if you are, you need, to, you need to look to the Lord, get back to where the Lord's voice is. Sometimes he allows it to draw us in deeper and closer to him. Sometimes it's our own dream. We went where we shouldn't have gone. What are we going to see that Avram does? He goes where he shouldn't have gone. Remember God told him, go where I show you. Did God say, go down into Egypt? No, he didn't. He told me he was going to show him the land where the, the, the Canaanites, Canaanites, I can't say that, where, here, you can go there. You want to go there? <laughs> um, there we go. There we go. He can settle there for a while. Um, I just need my clock. <laughs> oh, and it's 3.30. Okay, thank you, Max. You show me. I'm running out of time quick. Let me get to a point where we can stop. When it says he went down figuratively and physically, Egypt is south. He traveled south. But when we are going down spiritually, that's when we're in trouble. And that's what I see here. It was a downward move for Avram spiritually. We don't see that he sought the counsel of the Lord. Instead, he, he relied on the wisdom of his own flesh. I see we need food. He didn't go to his God and say, help me, show me, how am I going to take care of my people? Instead, he said, hmm, this isn't good here, but it's good down in Egypt. I'm going to go on down into Egypt. Nowhere do we read that God said, go down into Egypt. This was his own doing. He didn't call on the name of the Lord. He didn't, uh, and we're going to see he doesn't until he returns to Bethel. Until he comes back to the house of God, he, we don't see him call on the name of the Lord. And when he goes south into Egypt and he goes downward spiritually, yes, that's where he makes a big mistake. A mistake that costs him continually and will cost long beyond him, to his grandchildren down to even today. There are still consequences of it. If he'd waited on God, if he'd turned to God, if he'd trusted God, I believe God would have blessed him in the land of promise. But instead, he took himself and he went down. It's our first mention of Egypt in the scripture also. And I, let me give you that thought, and that's where we'll close it up for today. Um, evidently, this area below what we call Israel, this area called Egypt, was settled by the descendants of Ham's son. Ham, you know, his son, Mitzrayim by name, because Mitzrayim means Egypt. In Genesis 10, 6, we get that, that Ham's son was Mitzrayim, and since Mitzrayim means Egypt, it's believed that that's where Ham's sons went and lived. Remember that line? That's not the godly line. That's the line that's the cursed line that's going to be receiving not the blessings of God, but the judgment, the curses. So Egypt is filled, is probably settled by the cursed line. And we see in scripture, Egypt often is a place of trouble, especially for our Jewish people. Let me give you just one example. Oh, okay. I'm going to take you real quickly to Isaiah 31 and verse 1. Isaiah 31 and verse 1, where we read, my tablet, come on tablet, there we go. 
woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. That's what I believe is happening with Abram. He's looking to man's way of help. He's looking to what looks good to the eyes. But he's not seeking the Lord and the scripture says woe to those and it is woe for what happens to Abram down there. The Egyptians were known to be a polytheistic, that means they worshipped many gods. They were known to be very cruel. They were known to be very immoral. Polygamy, sexual promiscuity, common. Go to Exodus 1, Shemot chapter 1, and start reading. You've got slavery. You've got the death of male babies just because they want to subdue the Hebrew people. We know how we feel about abortion today. They thought nothing. Just kill off all the male babies. Can you imagine being a mama giving birth to a son in that time? And the horror of having your baby taken and killed. Egypt was very cruel. Egypt is a type of this world. To rely on Egypt is foolhardy and will give you nothing but heartache. And we're going to see it gives nothing but heartache to Abram. Apparently, even though Abram could look far and trust God for those far promises to be fulfilled, he, had, he was short-sighted. He had a hard time seeing the right now needs and how God would meet them in the right now needs. I've got some having to leave. I'm really tying up. You won't miss anything. I'll redo right here in the end. But I'll watch it. Okay. You, you can watch it. That's true. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Lord bless you both. So, um, God had blessed and protected Avram all along. He had no excuse for going on down into Egypt. But he does go. And we're going to see he's going to come out of Egypt. God's going to bring him back into the land where God wanted him. But he's going to come up in, into Israel with excess baggage. He's going to come up with a rebuke from a pagan king. The world is even going to rebuke Avram because he's out of being right with God. And we're going to see that harm comes to him from this trip into Egypt. If you're not getting my drift, he's going to pick up a slave girl in this trip down to Egypt. Anyone know what her name is? Hagar. 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 And oh, the consequences that come from that. But Sarai probably received her well in Egypt, and she is going to be a great source of trouble to Avram's entire family. So, learn a lesson. We need to stay even when it's hard and even when we can't see how we're going to be rescued in the physical, in, in what we see with our eyes. We need to see spiritually, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. So <clears throat> we're going to leave it here. We're going to pick it back up and I'm going to tell you, oi! There's a huge boo-boo that Abram makes here and I don't want to make fun of it because this, this was severe. If you don't know what it is, come back next class. We'll talk about Avram's big mistake and what happens as a result of it. Our choices do have consequences. That's why I'm encouraging you so strongly, stay close to the Lord, let Him guide you so that your consequences can be good and not costly like we're going to see for Avram. Doesn't mean it's over. God doesn't say you can't come back in. God's going to use Abram greatly in, it's still in time to come. He's a giant in, the, in um, an example of living by faith. But he also we see his human side. Uh, I also want to encourage you, just because you're in a hardship doesn't mean it's out of rebellion, out of not doing God's will. You can have hardships in your life because God's allowing things to come into your life to grow you in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord to know him more intimately and more personally. And unfortunately, where do we grow? In the hard places. I'd love to say, oh, we grow and everything's wonderful, but it takes sunshine, it takes rain to make those flowers grow. So, And it takes a bit of fertilizer, too, if you want them to look really pretty. <laughs> so don't, don't judge it. There's something wrong in your life means, oh, I'm suffering God's judgment. You will know if you are. You will know you did wrong. You will know what you need to confess to the Lord. But do it and get back with, right with Him because He always allows you to make a U-turn or 
come back in whatever way you need to. So uh, be encouraged in your walk and in your faith that your God is faithful even where you are not, but don't take advantage of it. I don't know about you, but I have no desire to go visit that little woodshed. Mm, I'd rather never see the inside of that place. <laughs> so, okay. Um, any questions before we close in prayer? Okay, then let's close in prayer and we'll pick up in verse 11. So we traveled a little bit. We're, we're not moving quite as fast as Auburn, but uh, I hope we're staying in God's will. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for visiting us. Thank you for being close to us, being intimate with us. Thank you for putting your spirit within us in this day and age when we are saved, that we can walk by faith, not by sight that we can stay close to you and see your answer to whatever our needs are. Lord, may we draw close to you. May we be in your word. May we be in prayer and to give opportunity for you to speak to us, to correct us, to move us, all according to your will, Lord. And I pray for each one to be filled with the, the power of the Spirit, to be blessed in all ways, to receive the benefit blessings that you've promised us also that you're the riches in glory that are ours through Messiah Yeshua Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your patience and your long-suffering. Thank you that one day we too will live in that eternal city whose builder and maker is you. Hallelujah. Can't wait to see our home, Lord. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Okay, we'll open up the mics. Your turn, comments, shalom. I think Beatrice is running. We're doing the I love you sign. <laughs> shalom, shalom. Lord bless you. Rhonda too. Boy, she went so fast. I don't know if she heard my goodbye. <laughs>